Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. My name is Dr. Kim Dismont Robinson. I'm the acting director of the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, and we'd like to welcome you to our Emancipation Commemoration event for 2019, the latter days of Mary Prince. At this time, I'd like to introduce my minister, uh, the Minister of Labor, Community Affairs, and Sports, the Honorable Levita Fogo, JPMP. Welcome, Minister Fogo. Now I know why Kim looks so tall. Do I look tall? Because I always wanted to be tall. I, I still do. Ladies and gentlemen, special invited guests, good evening. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's 2019 Emancipation Commemoration Lecture. This evening, we are very privileged to welcome Dr. Margot Madison McFadden, who is no stranger to Bermuda. You want to put your hand up so everybody knows where you are? Yes. <laughs> I think she has a new hair hairdo since the last time I saw her. Yes. <laughs> anyway. She rejoins us after completing a series of talks at schools around the island last February. Those talks were based upon research conducted by, Dr. by herself and sponsored by the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs in 2017, intended to examine the latter day. Okay. Intended to examine the latter days of Mary Prince. And she did this so that we might learn more about this woman who is recognized as a Bermuda national hero and internationally as an abolitionist, abolitionist icon. Dr. McFadden, I'm just going to shorten her name, graduated with a PhD from the Memorial University of Newfoundland where she wrote her dissertation on reclaiming histories of enslavement from the Maritime Atlantic and, curric and a curriculum, the history of Mary Prince. In this detailed account, she relays her extensive knowledge regarding the life of Mary Prince, following Prince's path from Bermuda to Antigua and London. We at the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, thank Dr. McFadden for her dedication to documenting the truth about Mary Prince's life. And I just want to clap here for that. I know I am eager to learn more about such a prominent figure in Bermudian history as it is so important for us as a society to acknowledge the contributions of our ancestors. And I know all of you here tonight are here for that very same reason. On a special note, I do want to acknowledge a new project that Dr. McFadden and Dr. Clarence Maxwell are starting this month, which is being sponsored by our Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. They formed the Mary Prince Research Group. This project begins to gather, sorry, brings together two lines of research undertaken by Dr. McFadden on Mary Prince and Dr. Clarence Maxwell on Mary Prince's role, both as an abolitionist and as part of the humanitarian revolution. Their partnership stretches back to May 2008, when the two met at a conference at Turks Island and together visited Turks Island sites connected with Mary Prince. Dr. McFadden and Dr. Maxwell rightly believe that a larger narrative needs to arise to discuss for the public Mary Prince's role in the cause of abolition and why she is a significant international figure. We are also delighted to have the evening conclude with a dance in tribute to Mary Prince, choreographed 
by none other than Conchita Ming. So we have much to get through this evening, and I won't keep you longer, except I do want to acknowledge the presence of Senator Caesar. I think she is here. And I do believe, if she's not here yet, M.P. Farbett, thank you, Ms. Caesar, M.P. Farbett um, is supposed to join us as well. So I just want to acknowledge them being in attendance, along with, everybody knows, the young lady sitting up front. She is considered um, the guru of community and cultural affairs. Ruth Thomas? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on behalf of the ministry, let me thank you all for attending this lecture. And I'm extending a special thanks to members of the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs and the Emancipation Committee for their work in organizing this program for us all to enjoy. Thank you, enjoy, and Let's continue to do whatever we can to avail ourselves of our important history. Thank you. Dr. Margot Madison McFadden is from West Vancouver, British Columbia, but she makes Prince Edward Island home. She graduated from the Memorial University of Newfoundland's interdisciplinary PhD program in May 2017. Her program of studies crossed the boundaries of two faculties, education and humanities and social sciences, and four subject areas, education, gender studies, history, and literature. As the minister had indicated, her non-traditional dissertation, Reclaiming Histories of Enslavement from the Maritime Atlantic and a Curriculum, The History of Mary Prince, includes a website, www.maryprince.org. Since graduation, Dr. Madison McFadden has worked at NIP uh, Nipissing University's Ontario History and Geography Departments, first as a Canada Research Chair Postdoctoral Fellow, and currently as a Banting Postdoctoral Fellow. Her Banting research project is entitled Mine the Onion Seed, the Bermuda Onion, Slave Narratives, Plant Knowledge, and 17th to 20th Century Commerce in the Global North Atlantic. In 2018, Dr. McFadden was sponsored by our department to research the latter years of Bermuda's national hero, Mary Prince. Uh, Dr. McFadden has been published in both cultural and scholarly journals, including the Newfoundland Quarterly, Slavery and Abolition, a Journal of Slave and Post-Slave Studies, and the Bermuda Journal of Archaeology and Maritime History. Dr. McFadden's most recent publications are Mary Prince, Cavendish, Enslavement and Historic Timber, which she co-authored with dendrochronologist Dr. Adam Ksenk uh, of University of Nevada and published in Historical Geography. The second, Theorizing Energy Landscapes for Energy Transition Management, Insights from a Socio-Ecological History of Energy Transitions in Bermuda, is co-authored with Dr. Kirby Calvert of University of Guelph and Dr. Kirsten Greer of Nipissing University and is published in Geoforum earlier this year. She is beginning work on a book about Mary Prince that she's very pleased to say will be co-authored with Bermuda's own Dr. Clarence Maxwell. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Margot Madison McFadden. So before I begin with my story, because this lecture is basically storytelling, I have a few thank yous of my own. I want to make sure to thank the Bermudians and Bermudian organizations who have made today's presentation possible. First, thank you to Bermuda's government, especially Honorable Levita Fogo, Minister of Labor, Community Affairs and Sports, and Dr. Kim Dismont Robinson, Acting Director, Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. Were it not for government, Levita and Kim, I would not be here today. Archivists at the Bermuda Archives have always been wonderfully helpful and friendly, especially Elizabeth Walter, Mandelis Lightborn, Ariana Smith, and Carla Ingman, Joanne Bragman, Director, Department of Libraries and Archives, and Ellen Hollis, Local Studies Librarian, have also helped me on my research path. The National Museum of Bermuda has been significant in my research, 
especially Dr. Edward Harris, who was my host supervisor the first time I came to Bermuda for research back in 2013. Elena Strong, Jane Downing, and Dr. Deborah Atwood have also assisted me over the years. The Bermuda National Trust and their publications has also helped me greatly. When I first came to Bermuda for research purposes, I was assisted by researchers Margie Lloyd, Diana Chudley, and Linda Abend. It was Linda Abend who initially realized the significance of the structure located on the Ocean View Golf Course and currently used as a maintenance building. More about that later. Thanks is also due to the Bermuda Historical Society, especially Andrew Birmingham and John Cox, and to citizens uprooting racism in Bermuda, especially Lynn Winfield. Valerie Richmond and her neighbors helped me in the Cavendish part of my research, which I will soon explain as part of my presentation. Valerie allowed Dr. Adam Shank, with me standing by as assistant, to bore holes in her floor, and she also first suggested the location of Mary Prince's Hole in the Rocks, Mary's hideout, when she was a fugitive from Captain John Ingham. Finally, I must thank Bermudian historian Dr. Clarence Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell was the external examiner of my PhD dissertation in 2017. He has helped me to grapple with important historical questions, and we are currently working together as co-investigators on the Mary Prince Research Project, which is under the wing of Bermuda's Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, as Lovita just said. Archivist Carla Ingman, who, whom I have already mentioned, is also a member of our research group. And our fourth member is Kishanda Curtis. I'm the only non-Bermudian in the group, and I am very grateful to be included. I'm going to put this down in case I knock it off. So my work has been to confirm the story of Mary Prince using archival documents. Uh, other people, mostly from their literature background, have been interested in the uh, team that put together her narrative, which we'll, I'll be talking about. But I was concerned to actually confirm her story, that it was true, that it wasn't fiction. Um, it was a true story. It's an autobiographical survivor account by an, a very important woman in our history. It's been very difficult because um, black people were not the keepers of archival documents in the past. And so I've had to piece together her story from finding things in church records, from parish assessments, from slave registers, from journals kept by uh, people who claimed others as property, and put the story together that way. As uh, Lovita said, Mary Prince is internationally recognized. She is a heroine of what was once the British Empire. And I personally believe that it was because of her work in London, uh, telling her story, to have it written down and printed in 1831, that government was pressured in, in England to bring about emancipation sooner than it might have. There was already move a, foot, or a movement afoot to bring about emancipation, but I think that she made it happen sooner. She's also the first known black woman to relate a slave narrative, have it written down and published. And I'm saying known because there could be another slave narrative that's yet to come forward. But as of today, she's the uh, first known black woman to uh, tell her story, have it written down, have it published. All right. So here's just some facts about Mary. She was born in Bermuda, 1787 or 1788. She died between 1833 and 1837, possibly in Antigua, but it could also still be London. She lived in Bermuda, Grand Turk Island, Antigua, and London. She was successively claimed by five different Bermudians. Uh, even though they may have lived in Grand Turk and Antigua, they were all Bermudians. Um, so let's just go through them quickly. The first was Charles Miners. And then uh, when she was an infant, she and her mother, Susanna, were purchased by old Captain George Darrell. And they were given to his granddaughter, Betsy Williams. So Betsy was actually the second person to claim her as property. And I know that other researchers have said, oh, it was Betsy's father, John Williams, or it was actually George Darrell himself, but it's Betsy. And um, I just wanted to point that out. 
by reading a little section from here, the very beginning. She says, I was bought along with my mother by old Captain Durrell and given to his grandchild, little Miss Betsy Williams. And then later on, when uh, John comes back from the American mainland or the West Indies and says, I'm going to sell Mary Hannah and Dinah, the sisters, Betsy uh, opposes. She says, oh, Mary, my father is going to sell you all to raise money to marry that wicked woman because Be Betsy's mom has died and now um, her father wants to remarry. You are my slaves, and he has no right to sell you, but it is all to please her. So, just to get that straight, it's Betsy, the child. Then the next one is uh, Captain John Ingham, Pembroke Parish. And after that, we have Robert Darrell, who's a Bermudian living in Grand Turk, but he also has a home here in Bermuda. And the last is Captain, or it's John Adams Wood Jr., a merchant situated in Antigua but he does come back to Bermuda. I suspect he had a house in Bermuda as well. He was very wealthy, and uh, actually Clarence Maxwell and I figured out that uh, when he died, he had put claims in <clears throat> at the time of emancipation for 737 enslaved people, and um, he got close to 10,000 pounds at the time, which translates to almost a million dollars by today's standards. All right, then um, she self-manumitted in London in 1828. She walked out the woods door and did not come back. She joined abolitionists and Dr. Clarence Maxwell and I believe she was an abolitionist. I know other people have said no, she would, might have been used by abolitionists, but she was an abolitionist, took action on her own. And uh, the testimony, the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave related by herself was published in 1831. So just quickly, British abolition and emancipation, there were two cycles. So the first cycle was earlier, the year she was born, 1787-1788, and it concluded in 1807. And this began with the Society for, Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade and concluding with, concluded with the passing of the 1807 Slave Trade Abolition Act. This meant that Africans could no longer be captured in Africa, sold on the coast, and brought over to British colonies. Didn't mean that there was no more slave trading going on between colonies, but it was illegal to actually bring somebody from Africa over. Then the abolitionists took about a 15-year break, and in 1823, they, uh, the second cycle was, uh, began with the formation of the Anti-Slavery Society in England and concluded with the apprenticeship program and the apprenticeship program ended August 1st, 1838. And there were about 800,000 British subjects who had been enslaved, freed at that time. So you can see Mary lived through the cycles. She um, was born around 1787 and died around this year. So she actually lived through the, whole, the two cycles. It's also important to remember that slave resistance played a huge role in bringing about emancipation. So you have the abolitionists working hard in London, hard in Antigua and different places, but you also have individual resistance such as Mary and group resistance. So you have slave uprisings and British Parliament was um, concerned about what was happening in the colonies because of the slave resistance. So it was slave resistance and the abolition movement that brought about emancipation. So now let's have a little talk about the team that put together the slave narrative. It's an, it was an abolitionist, collaborative, storytelling, compiling, and editing team. So we have um, the compiler, Susanna Strickland. She was a young woman who had just converted to Methodism. And she actually um, emigrated to Canada soon after she took down the slave narrative. So she's known in Canada as Susanna Moody. But at the time, she was a young woman, Susanna Strickland. And then we have uh, Thomas Pringle over here on the right, who I find a fascinating character. He was Scottish, he lived in South Africa, butted heads with Governor Somerset down there and as a result lost his jobs, uh, job as a librarian and um, came back to England with apparently five pounds in his pocket. And um, he was hired as the secretary of the Anti-Slavery Society. So he was the editor, 
Susanna was the compiler, Thomas Pringle was the editor and financial backer, and Mary was the storyteller. So even though these two had a part in bringing the narrative forward, it's still Mary's story. And I have confirmed that it's Mary's story. Susanna Strickland didn't make it up. <laughs> Thomas Pringle was busy attacking slave owners. He was trying to rid the British Empire of slavery, and so he's the one that actually took on John Adams Wood Jr., which ended, uh, ended up in a court case. Uh, Wood charged him with libel because of what was printed in the slave narrative. So Mary's testimony, that's the front page of um, a first edition that I found in the National Library in London. And you can see up at the top, it says the Reverend Mr. Mortimer with the editor's best respects. So the editor is Thomas Pringle. And he obviously had given this to Mortimer, who was the reverend at the local church. I'm going to show you the church in London. And Mary attended that church for one year. I call it an autobiographical survivor account because Mary survived colonial enslavement. She was terrorized and brutalized by some of the slave owners. She survived, and then she wrote her autobiography. So I would make a comparison to the Holocaust so if somebody had survived the Holocaust and was able to tell the story and have it written down, in the same way Mary survived colonial enslavement and then was able to have her story written down and published. So next we have her journeys. So I've got a map here of the um, North Atlantic and the pink parts of the British Empire back 100 or so years ago. And you can see Bermuda, right? Whoa, 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 what happened? I can fix that. OK. Oh. Oh. There we are. I have to be very careful. So there's Bermuda. We have London. Down here, we have Grand Turk. And down here, we've got Antigua. So these are the places that she lived. It's kind of in a triangle. The next slide shows her journeys. So she's born in Bermuda, right here. And then when she's about, I'd say 14, she goes to Grand Turk Island. She's there for 10 years with uh, Robert Darrell. And then he brings her back to Bermuda, roughly 1813. And she works for two more years at Cedar Hill Farm, I believe it is, at Cedar Hill. And then uh, she goes with Wood down to Antigua in 1815, and she's there for 13 years. Then he takes her to London in 1828, and the question has been, what happened to her in the latter days? So I think that there's some um, archival evidence that points to her returning to Antigua. So it may be that she returns to Antigua in late 1833. So let's look at Bermuda. Um, I'm the artist that drew the pictures of these houses, but my sister helped me put it together, and this is on the website, www.maryprince.org. And um, these are some of the structures we'll be looking at in Bermuda today. So this is um, Captain John Ingham's house. This was Elizabeth Watlington's residence, Palmetto, um, Cavendish, doesn't look like that anymore, the Pruden residence, and um, down here, I'm not sure which, Cedar Hill, somewhere on Cedar Hill. These are the locations that Mary lived in. And you can see I've got GPS coordinates or her parents, Mary or her parents. GPS coordinates, so you can look it up on your phone and find the place if you want to go there. All right. So in the Bermuda archives down the road, this was the first record I found with Mary. and. Um, so Moll is Mary, so the slave owners called her Molly or Moll. Her name was Mary, however. And this is the um, Devonshire Parish record, May 11th, 1790, for John Williams, Jr., the father of Betsy. So she's going to show up in, in uh, his um, register. This is the parish register. So we've got Moll there. And um, Susanna, Susanna, or Sue is her mom. And then we have Moll, Hannah, and then it says child. So child would be Dinah, her youngest sister. And uh, you can see, I, I guess you can't see from where you are, but 
Um, John Williams Jr.'s house is not worth very much. It's, uh, he's got a house, land, furniture, then he's got his um, enslaved people, and then down here is that one cow, one horse or something. Anyway, he doesn't have very much money. He's, he's a merchant, but he's not wealthy. This is his uncle's place, Samuel Williams down here, who owns Palmetto House. And he's, he's got two people who he claims as property, but his house is worth, I think it's 580. You can hardly see, 518 or 580 um, pounds, British currency and so on. So it's a much more elaborate house. Now this is where I found Prince, uh, Mary's father, first listed. It's a Paget um, or the Devonshire Parish Records. Oh wait, sorry. Paget Bestry Assessment, 1805 to 1824 for Daniel Trimmingham. And you can see right here it says half Prince 50. And the thing is, is Mary says in her slave narrative that a man named Daniel Trimmingham owned her father. But when you go into the records, you see that he shared the ownership of her father with his brother, Francis Trimmingham. And there were several men that they shared the ownership of. So they, the two men also owned a sugar plantation or a portion of a sugar plantation on Mustique Island, which is near St. Vincent. And they also owned property on St. Vincent, which I think must have been where their warehouses were. The estate was called the Adelphi Estate, which means um, brothers of the same womb, which makes sense. So uh, the two brothers, uh, Daniel and Francis, left their shares in the sugar plantation to their sons, Francis and George. And um, by that time, there were actually slave registers being taken. So you, I realized that there were 59 enslaved people owned by those, the Trimminghams on the Mustique plantation. And then some of them were in St. Saint, in Saint Vincent, where the warehouses were. And then they also had the enslaved people here on, in Bermuda. If you add it up, I was thinking we were pushing close to maybe 100 people that they had, that I've been able to find enslaved. Um, so that was the Trimminghams. The next is um, Palmetto House. Now, as I pointed out, it was Uncle Samuel who owned this house, Uncle Samuel Williams. And um, the National Historic Trust has, owns this building and they've done research on it. So um, nowhere does it say that John Williams lived in this house. It's, they think that it was Uncle Samuel and then it went to Benjamin, that's John's younger brother. But the way the dates work out, it seems like the house might have been empty. So it was Margie Lloyd who had done the research and wrote it up and she said, you know, it's the best guess. So there's a possibility that they lived there for a while. I kind of doubt it, but they were probably very close to this, close by to this house. So when you drive by and you see Palmetto House, you can think Mary was in this area. This is where she grew up with Betsy. So what happened was, um, when Mary got to be 11, she was put out to work at the Prudence residence, which is in Paget. And um, she was, her job was to take care of baby Daniel, but baby Daniel had an older sister, Fanny. So Fanny was close to the same age as Mary and Betsy. They were, Betsy, they were all kind of the same age. And Fanny um, was starting to teach Mary how to spell small words. Um, they also had a brother named James. This, this house, by the way, is privately owned. So what happened was um, she was put out to work because the Williams family was poor and Sarah needed money. So Mary's 11 or so, she was put out to um, take care of Daniel. The money would go back to Sarah Williams to help pay probably to feed her younger brothers and sisters. Um, when Sarah died, then Mary was brought back and readied for an auction where she and Hannah and Dinah were going to be sold so that John could marry a second time. And when she got back to the house, we don't know which one it was, but when she got back to the house, Betsy said, um, your mother, Susanna, is living at my aunt's place and you're to go there to be readied for the sale. So this is where Linda came in, she helped me, because I said, do you know where this house would be? I had figured out from, um, John Williams' mother's will, another Elizabeth, Elizabeth's will, that the only sister of John was Elizabeth and she had become Elizabeth Watlington. So I said, do you know where the Elizabeth Watlington house might be? And of course, Linda, with her sharp mind, she said, I know where that house is. <laughs> and so we drove straight there 
and um, it's now used as a maintenance building in the Ocean View uh, Golf Club. So um, the reason that it looks so derelict is back in the 1860s or so, the, the upper story was removed by the British military so that there was a clean line of fire from up higher down to the harbor down below. On both sides, I guess they were up at the top. And there were quite a few um, beautiful old houses in Devonshire that were ruined by having the top floor taken off. But this is where Mary uh, was taken with her sister to be ready for the sale. And she was um, put in new Osnabergs, so that's a type of material that was used for slaves. It was kind of itchy and coarse. And um, because we have the location of this house, and we know that Uncle Samuel lived at Palmetto, we're pretty sure that the house where Mary grew up is going to be kind of close by to this area. So she goes to the sale, and she's put up for auction. The auctioneer, it happened in Hamilton. I looked in the, um, like the Royal Gazette and could find no uh, trace of the, of the auction taking place, but there were, there were other sales of people that happened. So I think they must have just sort of thrown up a, so a soapbox in the middle of town. The girls came out and uh, the sale happened and Mary was sold for 57 pounds Bermudian currency at the time to Captain John Ingham. And there's the handout uh, when he came in the door where we explained what that was worth in today's dollars, 57 pounds. She says it was a great sum for a, a girl her age to um, be sold for 57 pounds. This was Captain Ingham's farm in Pembroke. And uh, you can see this place, this spot right here is, was the piazza because one of the things that happened was he was a cruel slave owner and um, one day, well, he was cruel to all of his slaves, let's just face it, but he was terrible. But um, what happened was that uh, there was a, a water vessel that fell apart in her hands. They were very upset that this had broken. It was an accident. And um, he came home the next day. He, he stripped her. He tied her on a ladder. And he had his son, Benji, who was about the same age as, as Mary, give her 100 um, whips on her back. And um, what happened was there was an earthquake and it's kind of a clue about the timeline, because the earthquake was February 19th, 1801. It was quite easy to find in the Royal Gazette. So she says the earthquake happened. It was clatter, clatter, clatter all around. She got away, and she went into the piazza and hid, and she was there all night. But the next morning, when she uh, woke up, they made her go to work anyway. The next terrible event happened was a cow got loose, because the Pembroke Marsh is down below this house. So you can imagine down there, there were cows that she took care of, horse and so forth. And the cows were, um, they were tethered out. So it wasn't like they were in a field that was fenced. They were tethered out so that it would just eat grass and couldn't eat the plants like sweet potatoes that were planted for the human consumption. Well, anyway, the cow got loose and ate a sweet potato slip. Captain John Ingham was furious and he took off his boot, which she said was a heavy boot, and he hit her with it right in the small of her back. And she, he, she says she felt the pain of that for the rest of her life. It was a weakness in her back. So soon after that, she ran away. She became a fugitive. Another event that may have entered her mind of why she decided to run was there was another woman who was enslaved, Hetty. And she was a French uh, person that had been taken off a, a ship by Captain Ingham. He was a privateer. And he had basically whipped her to death until she died. He murdered her. So Mary may have thought, I'm next. Like, he's hit me with the boot. I've been um, brutalized on this ladder. I better leave to save myself. So she runs to her mother. And her mother has gone to live with Richard Darrell. And his house at the time is Cavendish. He bought it in 1797. It needed to be fixed up. I know this from the um, journal of John Harvey Darrell, his son. Uh, it needed to be fixed up in 1797, but from the parish registers, we know he was living there before the earthquake happened. And we know that she ran after the earthquake happened. So this is the house that she ran to. And you can see the photograph on the, on the left. It's a beautiful house. Um, the military did the same thing. They removed the second story. So it started to be, you know, started to fall into its demise probably in the late 1800s. And then in 1969, it was turned into um, housing units. And uh, this 
is an entrance to the cellar. Over here, right next to this chimney, is an entrance to the cellar. Here you can see there's kind of a grate where the chimney used to be, but you can still get down into that cellar. And that's where um, Dr. Adam Shank and I, uh, with Valerie's help, got access to the cellar and we, with a dendrochronologic, dendrochronological bore, we um, took uh, timber fragments to be analyzed and um, Valerie also let us bore holes in her pine floor, <laughs> which we had analyzed and it came back from South Carolina <clears throat> and around 1860 possibly. So uh, it just confirms the story of uh, Max or Dr. Michael Jarvis that Bermudians were bringing timber in from the American mainland. And I've actually found some more evidence that Bermudians were up in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, 1770s, 1780s, bringing timber back to Bermuda too. It's part of my Mind the Onion Seed finding. So um, this is where she ran when she was a fugitive. Oh, wrong way. So here is um, the Devonshire Parish records for uh, Richard Darrell, and you can see over here, Sue, there's mum, and Beck, that's going to be uh, Mary's youngest sister, Rebecca, who Mary doesn't know is born until Rebecca, and uh, she's four years old at the time, and mum show up on Grand Turk Island. So this is when Mary's on Grand Turk, um, 1812. She would have just been coming back from Grand Turk, and mum and Rebecca are back before her from Grand Turk. Um, the question has come up, why, were mom and, why was mum and Rebecca sent to Grand Turk? An older woman and a little infant. Uh, one person said it could have been to cull, you know, cull out, because there were so many slaves on Richard Darrell's list. Perhaps he thought, if I send the, these um, um, people that, well, they're weaker, an older person and a younger person, perhaps they won't survive. But we do know that um, there was a head count every February in the Turks Islands, and uh, the slave owners would come out and everybody would stand in the ponds and have a head count. And based on that, you would get a percentage of the um, salt from the common ponds. So it could have been they were sent over for the head count. Um, I know that Ro uh, Richard Darrell, when you follow him through the slave registers, the list of people whom he claimed as property gets longer and longer and longer with each consecutive slave register. It doesn't look like he sold anybody. He kept everybody, and then at emancipation, they were freed. So there's more and more children being added on. So I'm not sure if the culling idea is actually what happened. But she was sent there. A third idea is that she may have been very concerned for Mary's welfare, and maybe she wanted to go. And maybe he said, you can go if you want. You know, it could be that. Oh, wrong way. So Valerie suggested that this is the hole in the rocks where Mary hid when she ran away from Captain Ingham. Um, in 1969, when the walkway was shorn, right here, this cavern was exposed. So Valerie and neighbors think that it might have been um, a big cavern that you entered from the top at the time of Mary Prince, because she does say it was a hole in the rocks, which sort of makes you think a hole that you would have climbed down. And her mother, um, Susanna, brought her food at night. Um, I guess everybody was out looking for her. She was a fugitive. It was, it was against the law to run away. People that ran away would be severely punished. And finally, Prince, her dad, found out that she was missing. And he came and he convinced her that she had to go back to the Ingham farm. She didn't want to go. Um, of course, what's she going to do? It's Bermuda. She can't really get away. There's no mountain you can go up and hide. And there's no boat for her to get on, so she had to go back. So she goes to uh, Grand Turk Island. We're going to get to that section in a second. But she comes back with Robert Darrell 10 years later. So she comes back in 1813. I know it has to be before 1813, actually, because the great August hurricane of Grand Turk Island happened that year. And she reports on being back in Bermuda and enslaved people who had been in Bermuda during this hurricane came back to Bermuda after her and told her about this huge storm that came in, filled all the ponds with sand, boats were sunk, people were homeless and so forth. 
had to be the great August hurricane, so I know she had to come back probably 1812. At the very latest, she was back by August 22nd, 1813, which is the date of the hurricane. And Robert Darrell put her out to work up on Cedar Hill, it just says Cedar Hill in the slave narrative. I believe that he was from Warwick, and so I'm thinking that it might have been Cedar Hill Farm. So I'm not saying it's the cluster cottages. I'm just saying probably up around that area somewhere. Somebody might find one day that that's where uh, she worked for two years. All her money when she was working went back to uh, Robert Darrell. He collected it every Saturday. So now we're on to Grand Turk Island. I've got a map here. So this is Grand Turk. This is Salt Key, and there were Bermudians on both. They were also on South Caicos, where they also uh, were uh, raking salt. So here we have the salt ponds in Cockburn Harbor. That's where Mary was located. For people that have read Antoinette Butts' um, book, the um, letter book of Captain John Lightbourne Sr. and William Atwood, I think it is, um, Lightbourne slaves were at Hawk's Nest which is right here, that's Hawk's Nest. And there's an old salt pond right there, so that's where they would have been working. And then I'm gonna show you pictures from Salt Key. The White House is right there, and that's a salt pond. So the Bermudians were very ingenious. They um, started raking salt where water had just maybe sprayed into a salina, and they would let it dry and rake it up. But then what they did was they had their um, slaves dig out ponds, and they had um, channels dug from the ocean right into the pond, and they had sluice gates. So when it was high tide, they could open the sluice gate, the pond would fill up with water, and they had sort of subsequent ponds. And they would, every, every 30 days or so, they would move the water from one pond to the next. It would get thicker and thicker until they finally raked it up as salt. Um, and Mary, does, Mary <laughs> does a very good description in her narrative about making salt on salt, on, um, in the Turks Islands. And the slaves had to stand in the brine all day. They got blisters on their feet. Sometimes it went right through to the bone. They went blind from the glare of the sun. And um, they weren't fed very well. They, they were starving on Grand Turk. And it's, this is borne out by um, Captain Lightbourne Sr. in the letter book where he says, um, leading up to the War of 1812, the Americans didn't visit anymore who they traded with. So they were in short supply of food. And this is probably why Mary says we were just fed on corn all the time. It was um, a thing that was called lublali. She called it blali. And it was just um, corn that they added water to, mushed it all up. It was like corn mush. And they ate it three times a day. So, so we know that Robert Darrow was the Mr. D of her slave narrative because <clears throat> Thomas Pringle actually concealed the identity of Mr. D uh, Captain I, Captain I's wife, and also Susanna Strickland, who was the compiler. And he says this was, um, for the three slave owners, this was because they, were, they had particularly atrocious behavior, and it was to, they had passed by the time the slave narrative came out, so it was to um, protect their descendants who might be innocent of all the things that were in the slave narrative. But he used the word lacerate, he said, um, he didn't want to lacerate <laughs> the people who were um, the descendants of these three brutal slave owners. And um, I thought it was interesting he chose the word lacerate because it was really Mary Prince who was the one who was lacerated, right? Her body was, um, when the slave narrative came out, um, people were, wanted to inquire. I mean, she talks about being flogged by all these people. Is it true? So they wanted physical evidence. and. Um, the Birmingham Ladies Society, who was interested in Antigua, actually. She, they were sending money down to Antigua through Joseph Phillips, who was kind of a fourth member of the writing team, to give to um, abandoned slaves. Um, they said, um, we'd like to have a look at Mary Prince's back and see if she really has been flogged as many times. So four, me four women took a look, and then they wrote a letter back to this Lucy Townsend, who was the secretary of the Birmingham Ladies. And they said that, um, She'd been cut unmercifully right down to the bone by the whips all down the back of her legs and back. And it was absolutely true what she had said. So one of these brutal slave owners was Robert Darrell. And um, 
It was actually a person named Nathan Sadler who first published that the Mr. D was Robert Darrell. Uh, but really it was the knowledge holders on Grand Turk, the elders knew and they told him and then he just confirmed it in the, in the, in the archives. So um, you can see here, that's Robert Darrell. And down here we have Richard Darrell. So in the slave narrative, Richard is known as Dickie and Dickie Richard. And they're the only two father-son um, slave owners in the registers whose last name starts with D. So we've been able to confirm. So here we have the salt key, salt pond. So these are taken probably in about 1950. And um, this is salt key. You can see the White House right there. It's still there. And all the ponds. And here we have people. He's in his, he doesn't even have boots on but he's raking the salt into little piles. There's ponds in the background. And these are the wooden water wheels that Mary talks about, where um, people would have to stand all day. And as they're moving the brine from one pond to the, uh, pond to the other, they'd just be moving it like this. One, things that, one thing I found out was that um, there were windmills that were put in uh, to move the water from pond to pond, but that didn't happen until after emancipation. Similarly, here in Bermuda, as far as cultivation went, the plow wasn't used until after emancipation. It was the hoe that was used before. And so this was all busy work to keep people busy, right? Rather than use technologies that would enhance um, the production of the salt or of the soil in Bermuda. That's a salt rake taken from, a picture taken in the museum in Grand Turk. And that's Robert Darrell's house. It's not there anymore, it's been turned into apartments. But uh, she did say it was made of wood and it was low. Um, he has these jalousy shutters here. This is salt, because right in front of the house was the salt yard. So you can imagine back in the day, he'd be able to stand up there and look out at all the big piles of sand, or sorry, salt. Um, to the right this way was the ponds and to the left this way was where the tall ships would come in to load up the salt. This in, was in the backyard. It's still there, unless a hurricane has taken it out. And it was um, two slave dwellings. So there's two entrances, one there and one there. And there's a wall. We think in there, there might have been a whipping post. So if it's still there, then archeologists need to go down and take a look at that. Uh, this is the long shed. She talks about being locked up in the long shed. And she said they, were, um, they had kind of like stalls like cattle and there were boards that they lay on. Uh, they had no mattress or anything, so they'd gather, on Sundays, they would gather up grasses and lie on it like it was a mattress, especially their feet that were very sore. They'd make a little pillow for their feet to be on. You can see the barred windows there, and the, the walls have been fortified over the years. The um, elders, the knowledge holders of Grand Turk say that's the oldest building in the Turks and Caicos Islands, built in the 1700s. And that's the same uh, little slave uh, dwelling that's in the backyard of, of um, Daryl's property. And this is a street post. And it, I should have taken a better picture, but it actually says Daryl Lane or something on it. It's actually this road here. Is D no, it's Daryl Alley. So this is Middle Street, and Daryl Alley crosses it. So now we're moving on to Antigua. And I've got a map. You can see. This is another, or more salt ponds. It's called the Flashes. And interestingly, there's this area right here is called Bermudian Valley. So I have a feeling that if we did some research, we'd find that Bermudians were probably involved with these salt ponds. There's St. John's where Mary was with the woods. And right here, there's gonna come up um, a place called Casada Garden. And Casada Garden is just outside St. John's. This is this um, slave register from Antigua for 1817, and it was when I first found Mary in the slave registers. Um, there's John Adams Wood, merchant proprietor, and it says Molly here, black and 30 years old. 
So that works out perfectly. 1817 minus 38 is 1787. So in 1819, she became a Moravian. She was actually baptized in the Church of England, but left. She was interested in the Methodist Church and also the Moravian Church. And you can see that this engraving was done in 1822. She became a Moravian in 1819. So it's very possible that she is under that tree, being getting instruction. Or if it wasn't her, then, some, then uh, somebody like her. This is the Moravian Mission. And this is called the sandbox tree. So when the Moravians first went to Antigua, I think it was 1767, something like that, <clears throat> they uh, would teach underneath this tree. And it's still there today on the Moravian mission. That's my aunts are over there, so, uh, 2011, when we went down. Most of their mission is gone, but uh, the old cistern is still there. And when you look here, you can see there's a, a, all this water was collected and the cistern was behind, so you can kind of figure out where the buildings would have been from the location of the cistern. So she said that there were missionary women who taught her to read and write. And this is a, a book from the uh, Moravian archives. And here we've got um, Sauter, Mary Sauter, and Joanna Richter, um, two of the women who taught her to read and write. So I, was, I had trouble finding Mary, actually, in the Moravian records. And the reason is there's another, uh, she married um, Daniel James in 1826, a free black man. So then she was known as Mary Prince, Mary James, and the Woods called her Molly Wood. So she was going by three names. And there was another, so I was having trouble locating her. But there was another Mary James, um, also a member of the Moravian church, who became a Moravian about the same time. I had trouble kind of sorting them out. And the other Mary James um, had perfect attendance you know, at the church. She ended up being um, somebody that uh, overlooked the speakings. This is when uh, once a month or so, uh, women would meet with this person and they would tell, them, tell her all their problems. She'd help them through. Our Mary uh, was not like that. She was rebellious. So um, I, <laughs> I soon realized that there were two Mary James in the book. But this also shows um, Daniel. So there's Daniel James and his church number. Did I put it there? His church number is, um, I think it's 5837. And it shows that he's free in town. He was baptized like Mary in the English church. And there's his wife, Mary Wood. So that's the first evidence that I could find of the marriage. Found another one. It's another, uh, the Moravians were very good at keeping registers. So here we have um, Daniel again with the church number, baptized in the English church. Um, and it says the T means free in town. And um, he's married to Mary Wood. There she is again. And this one shows that he was received actually into the Moravian congregation. Um, February 8, 1829 but that he was previously baptized in the Church of England. So like Mary, they were both baptized in the Church of England, but became Moravians. So there's one more that I found with Daniel. <clears throat> now he was excluded from the Moravian Church on January 12, 1834. We're gonna be talking about that in a minute. And here we have, see it's, these are all the Daniels. So it's Daniel, James, there's this number. And up here there's an exclusion mark and it says, um, 134, so January 34, he was excluded. People were excluded for all different things, like playing a tambourine in the market could get you excluded. Um, but also adultery could get you excluded. So you'll notice that there's uh, quite a few people with exclusion marks here. He's not the only one. Uh, he's in the company of other people, all right? And now we have Mary. So I was kind of shocked when I found this because we've got Mary, and it, I was happy because it gave the church number, 6599. There she is, Mary Wood. Um, when this was written down, she wasn't married yet because it says none for husband. But there we, where we are, she's, it's 1219, so she's um, received December 1819. But then there's an exclusion mark right there, and it says in England. So it's like she was excluded 
after she went to England, somebody came back and added this information in. And it was the first time I'd heard that Mary herself had been excluded for something. And again, I counted it up, about one third of the women on this page are also excluded. Okay. So now we're in London. The Woods took her to London in 1828. She, they, they went probably June, July, maybe early August, 1828. She was with them for a few weeks. She walked out their door and didn't come back. So um, British law, or law in Britain at the time did not support slavery, but slavery was supported by law in the colonies. So she was free in England, but if she went back to Antigua, she'd be re-enslaved by Wood, who in my, the way I think of him is he was vindictive, manipulative, and very stony hearted. So she didn't want to fall back under his power. He would probably, and she does say in the slave narrative, he might fell, uh, sell me for a field slave. So he might um, put her out to work on a plantation, which would be the ultimate worst that could happen. Oops. So here's our map of London. And um, that says Claremont Square, so it's kind of the anchor of this whole thing. We have the Church of St. Mark there. Remember how on the front of the first, um, the first page of the, of the narrative it said, to my dear friend or whatever, Mortimer, editor from the editor, best, respe best respects. Mortimer was the, um, was the reverend at this church and it was new at the time. And then over here we have, this was Solly Street because it says in the narrative that Mary told her story to Susanna at number seven, Solly Street. Well, I, nobody could find this Solly Street. Well, it turns out the name was changed and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And also a bomb during World War II blew up the building. And so you've got these, it's kind of an unattractive apartment building. But looking right next door at this, it was a group of terraces. You can sort of see what it would have looked like back in the day. So this was her area in, in um, London at the time. And there was also a, a location called Black Mary's Field. And I'm not sure if it's our Mary, but I know that Susanna Strickland, who was very voracious with her you know, writing, she talked about Black Mary came to my wedding. They were, they were friends, but she called her Black Mary, thinking maybe there was white Marys around. <laughs> but there was Black Mary's Field. So Black Mary's Field may have been in this area before it was all built up. So here's the uh, slave register for John Adams Wood, 1832. And Mary's left his service, so he has to write in, save and accept Molly who accompanied me to England and there quitted my service. So it's confirming the story that she walked out the door and didn't come back. And there's just um, number seven, Solly Terrace was renamed number 60 Great Percy Street and then destroyed by a German bomb in World War II. That's the church that she went to. And there's a lovely park right next to it where lots of people um, walk their dogs and so forth. It's another view, Claremont Square. And it's kind of odd because you can't get into that square. It's all surrounded by this fence. There's no way in. And it's because it's water, underneath is waterworks. So it's just there and people, you drive around it, but there's nothing in it. Okay, so while she's in England, there's political and legal action taken by the abolitionists and Mary. So the first political action is the petition. On June the 24th, 1829, there's a petition presented to Parliament. And we've got the three names of Mary Prince listed there. It begins with, a petition of Mary Prince or James, commonly called Molly Wood, was presented and read. And the petition rest, requested that Mary be able to return to Antigua a free woman. It failed, the British Parliament turned it down. And then the next big one was February 1831, the publication of the history of Mary Prince. And there was a second slave narrative published on the heels of the history of Mary Prince, and it was Ashton Warner's Negro Slavery Described by a Negro. He was a young man from St. Vincent. And what I think is that you were supposed to actually read the two of the slave narratives together. It was like in tandem, because um, when you read them together, you get a better idea of the corruption of colonial enslavement. Um, he was married. Uh, his young wife, Sally, was a field slave on a sugar plantation. She was treated horribly by the manager. They had a child. 
Um, the reason that he finally took off and became a fugitive was he didn't want his wife and um, son to be raised in slavery. And also his um, slave narrative was about um, colonial law because Ashton Warner was actually freed when he was an infant. Um, his aunt, Daphne Crosby, had um, inherited some money. She was a free woman. And when her husband, Dennis, I think it was, died, she had money and she immediately bought as many of her family members from the King Grove estate as possible. And she um, purchased her sister who had the infant, Ashton, so he was free. He went as a package with his mom. And then the um, plantation uh, ownership changed. And when he was 10 years old, suddenly the new owner, James Wilson, showed up and said, you belong on the estate. And they seized him and took him back. So he was illegally re-enslaved. And the family had manumission papers. They tried everything they could. But the um, people in authority kind of banded together. And everywhere they tried to get help, um, there was no help to be given. So finally, Ashton um, became a fugitive and uh, got off the island, went to England. And he was going to confront James Wilson, who lived there, and say, hey, not only am I free, but you owe me money for 10 years of, of labor. Turns out James Wilson had died. And um, the executors of his uh, estate kind of took pity on Ashton. They gave him a stipend to live on and said they would look into it. And um, he ended up actually living at, in the Pringle house along with Mary. And Susanna took down the slave narrative. But then he died before it ever even was printed of what they said a rapid inflammatory complaint, which I think might have been tuberculosis. And um, actually, Clarence Maxwell pointed out that Thomas Pringle also died of probably tuberculosis. So there may have been disease in that house you know, that was spreading or at the church that they went to. So then we have the two court cases. <clears throat> Because the slave narrative comes out, and John Adams Wood Jr. has been pretty much dragged through the coals by Thomas Pringle. He looks terrible. He's vindictive. He wouldn't free Mary. She tried. She earned money. She tried to um, purchase her own freedom. She finally had to just leave the house. <clears throat> and um, what happened in the first court case was um, a man named James McQueen. He was also Scottish, uh, like Pringle. He was uh, writing um, pro-slavery tracts in different magazines. One was called Blackwood's Magazine. And in, in that, he attacked Mary and he attacked Pringle. And he said that um, she was living in Pringle's house for sexual reasons. And so um, Pringle finally got mad and said, I'm going to start a libel suit, which is what he did. And um, James McQueen, the writer of the article, conveniently was in Glasgow and couldn't come down <laughs> to show up in court. So uh, it was another fellow, Cadell, who was a publisher. And he stood in. And uh, it ended up being kind of settled. The second court case, Wood versus Pringle, was actually John Adams Wood Jr. sued Pringle for libel. So they were held one week apart in London. So when I was in London um, last January, I was trying to find these court cases. And I did get as far as finding, um, this one is Pringle versus Cadell. You can see the names right here. And the court case was number 544. But I haven't actually been able to find the testimony. So the testimony that people talk about, which is where um, Mary goes in, it's actually the second court case, the one with Wood. And they go all through her sexual history of all different men that she had known throughout her life. Um, that testimony that people talk about was actually in the London Times. It wasn't the actual recorded testimony. And we think it's probably only about 25% of what was actually put taken down. So the goal is to try to find that, because there's probably going to be more about Mary's life if we could find it. Uh, in the, in the um, Pringle versus Cadell, uh, she just got on the witness stand and said, I told my life story to Thomas Pringle. That's it. And then they kind of settled. <clears throat> so what I did find, some more evidence from the uh, first court case, the one with Cadell, was that um, George Stephen, who was an abolitionist lawyer at the time, he, um, 
He always took on abolitionist cases to protect abolitionists and you know, pro bono, he didn't charge anything. But he took a witness statement from Reverend Curtin, who was the, purchase, the person who had baptized Mary in Antigua back in 1817. And so the witness statement was taken over three days and uh, all sorts of questions asked about different individuals in Antigua, all to do with punishment. It's kind of interesting. But included was this um, copy of Mary Prince's baptismal record. And that was quite interesting to find because it says right here the date, which is April 6, April, uh, 1817. And then he puts her name down as Mary Princess of Wales. And then this is dad and he puts dad down as Prince of Wales. And then we have Susanna. And then he gets the age wrong. He has Mary um, five years younger than she is, I believe. But he does say that she can read. And then over here, he has all sorts of details. When people come in to see him, he adds details. So he says that she was troubled by a man named Oysterman when she first came to the island. And she did, in that testimony I was talking about, she does mention that. And that she then um, was living with uh, Captain Abbott for you know seven years before, this, before she married Daniel James and so forth. And then it says in here that um, she visited him in February 1831. And I think what happened was, was um, they'd done the slave narrative, now they had to prove that what they were saying was true. And one way to prove it was to find her baptismal, get a record of this baptiz baptism to prove that she was baptized by Curtin. And he happened to be in London. So she went and knocked on his door and got a copy of it. And he actually wrote it down that she'd shown up. And then when the witness statement was taken, this thing was completely copied out. It says down in here that it was copied and then there's, whoops, different signatures. Okay, <clears throat> so the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, I did say that I'm pretty sure the slave narrative of Mary and Ashton, but especially Mary, brought this, made this happen sooner. But there's um, a third part of the act. Most people just focus on August 1st, 1834. Um, it received royal assent August 28th, 1833. It took 11 months to receive um, emendation in the colonies because I mean, they didn't have internet, so you know, the letters had to go out to the governors, they had to sort, how, sort out how it was gonna happen in each colony, and then it would come back and everything went ahead. So August 1st, 1834. But section three says that all slaves who may at any time previous to the passing of this act have been brought with the consent of their possessors and all apprentice laborers who may hereafter with the like consent be brought into any part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland shall from and after the passing of this act be absolutely and entirely free to all intents and purposes whatsoever. So this means that as of August 28th, 1833, anybody who had been in Great Britain or Ireland was free. They didn't have to wait until August 1st, 1834. So Mary is free if she goes back to Antigua. However, there's still a problem because that's where John Adams Wood lives and he's probably not gonna go along with this very well. However, I think she probably did go back. She has said in the slave narrative all through, I want to go back to my husband, Daniel James. So in, in Antigua, there's an oral tradition in the Moravian church, and it was um, Dr. Kingsley Lewis, the bishop of the um, Eastern Division of the Moravian Church of the West Indies, told me this when I was there in 2011. I, I was really lucky, I was there at Christmas, and he was, there was a, the best Christmas pageant ever at the Spring Gardens Church, and he was there. So we kind of sat in a back pew, and he told me all about the story of Mary Prince in Antigua. So I consider him a knowledge holder, and he said that Mary returned to Antigua, was arrested and locked up, but later freed, and was present at Spring Gardens Moravian Church for the emancipation celebrations, August 1st, 1834. So I thought, hmm, now how am I going to prove that? So I found details of Daniel James's exclusion. And um, right here, here he is, Daniel James. And he was living what the Moravians call in concubinage with Mary Ann Williams. This is what got him excluded. So it says, um, I'm gonna just have to get down here. No, I can read it right here actually. 
So it starts right here, and it ends right there. So it's this part in here. It says, proved to have been in the custom of fiddling at dances in the town. And she does say that he was a fiddler. And you weren't supposed to make music if you're a Moravian. And by acknowledgement of both parties to have lived in concubinage with Mary Ann Williams during the absence of his wife, Mary Prince, in England. So when I read that, I said, sounds like she's back. And um, it could be. <laughs> It could be that she came back and found there was this relationship. And um, it's actually Natasha Lightbourne, who's written about um, enslavement in Antigua, said that women, when this was going on with um, their husband and another woman, they would often go to the Moravian authorities and complain and get, um, you know, get, it, get them broken up by the Moravian authorities. So it kind of falls into that um, situation. Then... So I thought, well, maybe this is proof that she came back. Then I found this in the Bethlehem Moravian archives. And um, I was kind of confused for a while because it says here, Maria Musgrove, and then it says uh, Maria Griffiths, and then James is up above. But the husband is Daniel James, and there's an M right there, which means married in the English church. A lot of the time spent in the Moravian archives was figuring out what all the codes were of exclusion and free in town, died, there's all these little marks. So that means married in the English church. So finally I thought, maybe he got married again, right, to another woman, which would mean our Mary had died. Oh, and I just wanted to point out, so this is not Daniel James's record, this is this Maria Griffith. She has perfect attendance at the speakings in, in 1836, 1837. And then you can't see it, but right there it says, um, gone to Green Bay. And the Moravian church was expanding into Green Bay at the time. So it may be that she and Daniel moved down to become like congregation members for the new area. So then it was, could I find a marriage record for Dan our Daniel and this um, Maria Griffith? And um, he'd been excluded from the Moravian church. So the Moravians are not going to marry him. So I thought it's gonna be a Church of England record because he was baptized in the English church. And sure enough, it was actually Gary that found this, right? And um, there he is, Daniel and Maria Griffiths. And it was a marriage by bands, which means that they publish it and people can come forward and say, they can't get married, you know, they're cousins or brothers and sisters or married. And so, um, they were able to get married. So I would imagine the Moravians would come forward and say, if, Mary, if our Mary, Prince, was still alive, he would not be able to get married to Maria Griffith, right? And uh, finally, we have Daniel applying for readmission to the Moravian church. So there's his um, number, 5836 or whatever, Daniel James, and um, he begins the process for readmission October 24th, 1841. And what they did is you, had, you, you put your name forward and you had to go through three different kind of events till finally maybe you got back in. But he was successful January 14th, 1843. So it took him just over a year to fully be readmitted to the Moravian Church. And again, if he had married somebody <laughs> when he was married to somebody else, the Moravians would not have readmitted him to the church. So I went and I talked to um, uh, Kingsley Lewis and said, what do you think about this? And he said, I agree, Mar our Mary must have passed for this wedding to have taken place. So then we were on to looking for a death certificate for Mary Prince. And um, she had been excluded from the Moravian church. So she's probably gonna be buried with the Church of England. She would have gone back because they were very strict about how they did things. And um, the only record I found that works is Mary down here, Mary, and the curate never put the surname in. So it just says Mary, no name, and uh, black, the B is for black, and she's um, living in Quesada Garden, which was that area I showed you just outside St. John. And um, she was buried November 13th, 1835. So that kind of works out with the date for um, Daniel James getting married in April 1837, 
right? So I think she may have come back, found him living with Mary Ann Williams, broke that up. We don't know if she ever got back together with Daniel James or if she was single, but then I think she may have died and then he was able to get married to his, th actually his third wife. Because in the slave narrative, she, when she married him, she said he was a widow, a widower. So it's his third wife. And um, when she came back to Antigua, she would have had a really ruined body. She would not have been in very good shape. She had rheumatism. She, was, she had what they called a disease in the eye. She was going blind. And you know, she'd been brutalized by those slave owners. So um, she may not have actually been in very physically good shape when she returned. Another person has suggested that when she came back, John Adams Wood, according to the Moravian tradition, she was arrested, locked up, and then freed. <clears throat> he might not have liked that, and he, she may have been pushed off a cliff or something. It, you know, that might have happened too. We don't know. Um, I have looked for, in Antigua, when I was reading the governor's dispatches, he talks about a special record, it's called the Claims of Freedom. And it was a record, it was part of the Court of Common Pleas, and it was for people who had been, you know, fugitives and had been arrested, but said, I'm supposed to be free. I'm not, I'm not an enslaved person. I have, um, you know, freedom, that they could go to this Claims of Freedom Court and be heard. And I have looked everywhere and I can't find that because I thought if it still exists, we'd find Mary's name in there because she was arrested and then freed and then able to be at the Spring Garden Church. So the thing is, is we can't really say for sure that she died in Antigua. The ducks kind of line up that she did. She could have also died in London and the news of her death could have traveled to Antigua. The Moravians could have taken the news, the abolitionists could have taken the news. Uh, friends could have taken the news, and then Daniel would have known that he was free to get married the third time. So that's the end of my storytelling. So I know we have some questions. Oh, we're, we're taking them on the index cards, yeah. Do you have a few? Uh, Dory's got one. Sorry. Does anybody have any questions on index cards they'd like to submit? Ah. Thank you. Mustique Island, is that the same island uh, owned today by Sir Richard um, Brendan? I Hansen? do not know the answer to that question, <laughs> but it's very close to St. Vincent, it's just off, and I understand there's a little ferry. When I was in Antigua, I actually met some people. I believe they lived on Mustique Island, and they were just vacationing in Antigua. So I was asking them about the Cane, uh, Cane Grove Plantation. Uh, was there any indication about her father, like what's happened to her father? Yes, in the slave narrative, um, Thomas Pringle added a lot of footnotes, and some people have said that it was an annoyance, it was like he was whispering on the side and kind of meddling with Mary's story, but there were um, unmentionable truths that were left out purposefully because the, it was an abolitionist tract and they wanted to have a wide reading audience. So, for example, uh, Robert Darrell had a terrible um, habit of asking Mary to bathe him, and we know that bathing him was a euphemism for sexual abuse. And that's why she ran away and um, went to the neighbors, be the second time she was a fugitive. <clears throat> she says, I cried all night, and then the neighbors helped her and went back and, you know, you can't do what you were doing on Grand Turk Island now that you're back in Bermuda. So he agreed that she could be put out to work at Cedar Hill. 
and, but he collected her wages every Saturday. So um, what, what Thomas Pringle did was because there, there had been, there was gaps and silences and then these euphemisms such as bathing, he would explain things in the footnotes. And um, he explains that um, she had 10, there were 10 of them in all. So there were four girls, no, there were 11 in all. She had 10 siblings, so there were four girls, including Mary, and seven brothers. And when she was on Grand Turk Island, Prince passed away. And I have found evidence of Prince in um, an archive. I'm gonna be looking for it when I go, I'm going with um, Dr. Maxwell in a week to the National Archives. And uh, it's 1796, and the Naval Depot is being built in St. George's. And uh, Daniel Trimingham sign, is signing, along with other slave owners, for the wages of men that have been working on the Naval Depot. And one of them is Prince, and Prince's partner is Jim, and they're both Sawyers, so you know, they're sawing the, the wood. And so um, other people have thought that they were apprentices and that they were like maybe the sons or something because he's put down as Prince Trimingham, Jim Trimingham, and then it's Daniel that's signing. But I recognized the names right away because I was familiar with the parish, parish um, registers. But that's Mary's dad, Prince, and that would be Daniel signing for the um, pay. So what I'm going to do is try to find this document because I read about this in another person's paper. It was Ann Coates. And I'm going to f go and find it. It's in the Admiralty files take a photograph and then see if I can find all those men that were signing and see if I can correlate it to the, people's, um, the people who they were uh, signing the wages and then we'll prove that there were enslaved people building the Naval Depot. So I did find evidence of Prince working on the Naval Depot, yeah. Uh, two related questions. Um, did Mary Prince have any children or are there any known relatives or descendants of Mary Prince from her sisters or brothers who may be living in Bermuda now? Hmm. Well, she doesn't report on having any children and people we've thought about, why would that be? She was hit in the back by um, Captain John Ingham with that heavy boot. That may have been a reason. She may have purposefully though, have chosen not to have children. And I know that enslaved women, they took abortifacients so that they would um, have miscarriages and not have children. They didn't want to have the babies be owned by the slave owners and be sold. So if Mary was being treated so brutally, why would she bring more people into the world? And the third idea is that she may have had a sexually transmitted disease because she was being um, abused by these men. So it wasn't just Robert Darrell. We think probably Captain John Ingham may have also been sexually abusing her. So there's different reasons why um, that could have happened. So in Bermuda, uh, it was Cyril Packwood actually said it was, the practice was called halving, like cutting in half. So when um, a man and a woman who were enslaved decided to marry, and I'm not saying they were legally married, but they became, you know, a couple, there was a contract that was drawn up between the slave owners of the woman and the man, and it was in regard to the children that were going to be born. So the firstborn went to the mother's slave owner, the second born to the father's slave owner, and it went back and forth like that. So with Mary, where there's 10 uh, siblings, then five would have been um, with the mother's slave owners, the Darrells, and five would have been with the Trimminghams. So I actually think the slave auction where Mary, Hannah, and Dinah were sold was probably illegal. First of all, Betsy says, you're my slaves, he has no right to sell you. But um, it may have been that George, who had given them as a, you know, given Mary and her mother as a gift, Betsy had passed. Sarah had passed, so there was nobody to stand up. And it may be that the Darrells said, you can sell the girls if we get the boys, because we're gonna need those boys in our um, maritime industry to work um, as sailors, coopers, sawyers, and so forth. We will apprentice them, and they will become more valuable. So um, slave owners, actually, actually, it was the wombs of black women that kept slavery going because the slave owners would look at them and say it's their, it's their offspring that are going to carry on the plantation in the next generations, or if we decide we're going to sell them at auction, they're going to enrich us. And so it was actually the wombs of the black women that were um, making colonial enslavement carry on. 
And that would be why Mary decided, I'm not having any kids, because <laughs> I don't want to put them through this. That might be, have been what happened. Yeah. Oh, but her sister Hannah was um, purchased by a slave owner, we don't know who, and uh, Thomas Pringle in one of those footnotes said she was taken to Trinidad. And so I'm thinking we might, if somebody were to t uh, follow that path, might be able to figure out a Bermudian who showed up with um, a slave named Hannah, and then together they had children. So Hannah did have children with that slave owner who had purchased her. And then of course the question is, what happened to the children? Did they get sold at an auction too? You know, um, we're not sure. And then Rebecca, little Rebecca, she says that Rebecca was still living in Bermuda in slavery at emancipation. And she is on the Richard Darrell slave register right up until the last register. And then we don't know what happened to her. The brothers, um, some of them may have been at that Mustique Island plantation or working as sailors, because the Trimingham brothers had ships. They, their, merchant, their business went from England to the American mainland to the West Indies. They, were they had their sugar and salt was moving all around. And of course, it was enslaved people that were doing most of the work, right? Do we have any indication about Mary's physical description? No, but I think she must have been really gorgeous when she was younger before her body really became ruined because these um, slave owners <laughs> were willing to pay a lot of money for her, right? 57 pounds for muting currency when she was roughly 12. And then Robert Darrell paid 100 pounds when she was a young adolescent. And then she sold again for 100 pounds to John Adams Wood. So she kept saying, this is a really large amount. And I was, um, my uh, supervisor at Memorial said, well, how can you prove that? She just said that it was a large amount. But it was um, Antoinette Batz's book, the um, Captain John Lightborn and William Aswood letter book. There was another woman who uh, was sold for 100 pounds. And, uh, and um, I think it's Atwood says, a huge sum. And it was right in around the same time. So it was a large sum then. Uh, the Moravian Church is mentioned quite a bit as part of this narrative. Yes. Um, is there anything that was uh, specific about the Moravian Church where this seemed to be the place where enslaved people were congregating? Well, she says in the narrative that um, she was, it was Christmas. Uh, she went to the Winthorpe's plantation with the slave owners and um, they were given time off. So she was invited to go to a neighboring plantation and uh, it, the people were Methodists and she was, they were sort of speaking the truth and telling what had happened. And she, she realized that she was, had been a sinner. She cried and cried and cried and felt more attracted to you know, the word of God. Before that, um, in Grand Turk and in Bermuda, it doesn't, she doesn't seem to have had any religious you know, um, education at all. But she decided to go with the Moravians, not the Methodists. And I think it's because the, um, actually she says when she's at the Methodist prayer meeting that it's the first time she ever understood uh, a prayer. And uh, Sue Thomas actually said it's because it was in the local Creole. So she understood it. It wasn't you know, the Anglican church with um, vocabulary that she wouldn't really understand. And so the Moravians would have done the same. It would have been in the local Creole. And they also, um, the Moravians, they made, um, I think it was like communion. They had sort of a love, a love um, it's called a love feast, I think. And it was very, um, what would you call it? I guess symbolic of water. And uh, people that I've read, uh, what's his name? Anyway, he, there's one scholar and he says that the Moravians knew what the African religions had been like and they kind of tried to match it with how the Moravians were doing things. So it made it comfortable to fit in to be a Moravian. And um, also it was in the local Creole. And also the missionary women were teaching her to read and write, which might have also been very attractive. Um, whereas she, when she was baptized in the uh, Church of England, she wasn't really getting any instruction. And I think that she was very keen to learn, so learning how to read and write would have probably also influenced her decision. As an index card can put their hand up so they can be collected. Um, is there any connection between Mary Prince and Captain Jemmy Darrell? Captain who? Jemmy Darrell. I don't know, but with the name like that, possibly there is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are your feelings about uh, this being a, 
subject taught in, in the Bermuda schools? Oh, well, I think it's really appropriate to be taught in not just Bermuda schools, but um, all the countries that were once part of the British Empire, because she's really a, she's a re inter internationally recognized figure. It's very important. Um, I have come up with an approach of how I would do it, because I, I was an English teacher for, for 18 years before I decided to do this. And I think I made a mistake that many teachers did at the time, which is that I would um, introduce a book of fiction and people would read it and they'd say, yeah, but it's all made up. How do we know it's true? And so I thought about this and I thought the important thing is the autobiographical survivor account, the actual slave narrative, um, or the actual Holocaust survivor account, or the actual residential school survivor account. So you begin with that and then you need to confirm it with um, primary sources, which is what I've done here. So you can't really refute the story because we found Mary in the slave registers in the Moravian church registers and so forth. And then the third part is to visit the land. So that's why I have that little map there. If you were in Bermuda, you could visit the different sites where Mary was and kind of get a feeling. Often when you're out on the land, you get a different feeling than if you're just reading about it in a book. And then the fourth part, is that's where you actually read what scholars have written. Because sometimes you agree with them, sometimes you don't. And then the fifth part is actually, that's when you read the, the neo-slave narrative, the fictional account, or you watch the, the movie. So I'm thinking right now, <laughs> we're ready for somebody to do a screenplay, and we have enough information that we could probably have a great film about Mary Prince, right? filmed in all the locations of where she lived because we know where all the buildings are and so forth, yeah. And uh, final question, uh, aside from her story as an abolitionist, um, there's very little describing her temperament as an enslaved person. Is she connected to any tangible story of rebellion? <laughs> well, she was rebellious. She uh, ran away and was hidden in the hole in the rocks. Then when she came back, she ran away again from Robert Darrell and was put out to work at Cedar Hill. When she was in Antigua, she got married to Daniel James without permission from the slave owner, which made him extremely angry. He was, she was whipped for that, by the way, for getting married to Daniel James. And when you think of it, or not, um, Wood whipped her with a horse whip. Um, like, what sort of person would do that when you want to spend your life with somebody and they're gonna stop you? Um, I think it's because he wanted to have absolute control over her and um, Marriage was actually illegal uh, between slaves, between a freed person and a slave, unless you had the permission of the slave owner. And I think it might have been to control the children and the money that went with the children when the children were born. So she was really, when she got married to Daniel James, that was total rebellion. And I think that might be why uh, she was taken to London. She agreed to go though, because she thought that she'd be freed once she got there, and then she'd just turn around and go right back to Antigua and be with Daniel. And it just didn't work out the way she had thought it would go. Now, <clears throat> there was another person from Antigua who's gone down in history called Grace Jones. And she was an enslaved woman who was taken by the slave owner, Mrs. Allen, to London. I think it was 1822. And um, Mrs. Allen neglected to get permission because if you were going to take a slave from one colony to another, you had to get a written note of permission. She, did, she neglected to do that. And then the year, a year later, Grace was brought back to Antigua without any notes. So the customs officials, who looks like they might have been abolitionists, took um, a, an exception to this, and they seized Grace and said that she was illegally enslaved in Antigua. She was a free woman. So this went to court, and it went on and on and on. It was kind of settled by 1827. The uh, judge said that Grace was free in England but that didn't mean she was gonna be free when she went back to the colonies. So um, she was re-enslaved. And what I discovered when I was reading the um, governor's dispatches was that she's gone down in history with the wrong last name. She's really Grace James. So it could be that she might have been some relative of Daniel because they thought if um, Mary went to London, she would be free. So in the governor's dispatches for Antigua, there was all sorts of stuff going on about this Grace James and people were um, rising up and saying, you know, she should be free, we should be free. There was kind of a movement. 
And I think they just thought that Mary's going to ride on the wave of that and become free. And it just didn't, didn't work out the way they thought it was going to go. Mm -hmm. okay. Good evening again, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. McFading. I, I know that all of you have heard the expression, if you don't know where you came from, how will you ever know? One, who you are or where you're going. And so you just highlight for us the extreme importance as a people of us trying to find out every itty bitty detail we can in terms of the role we play in the history of Bermuda and the development of Bermuda and the price we paid along the way. And I think until that complete story is told, we will always be at a disadvantage. And so we want to thank you and those who engage in like behaviors in terms of the research, Dr. Maxwell being one, one such person, for doing your part to capture a piece of history that makes a whole wealth of difference to, to all of us, I think. And certainly someone as world-renowned as Mary Prince and all that she represents to us particularly, to blacks as a people, and to the world at large. Um, and every piece of information that you have been able to uncover to give real meaning and life, if you will, to everything that she represents really um, is something that we could never be thankful enough for because we hunger for and we absolutely need to have that history exposed and told. And so thank you for all of the efforts that you have gone through and those that you continue to go through to try and help the world to know the real story. Thank you. Just before the dancers come out, I, um, I just want to say I, I never thought that I'd be doing this. I um, lived in the Turks and Caicos Islands from, I think it was 2005 to 2009. I was, English, I was the head of English at British West Indies Collegiate, and I like museums, so I went to Museum Day on Grand Turk one day, and that's when I realized that Mary Prince had been enslaved on Grand Turk for 10 years. So I said to my husband, Gary, we have to move to Grand Turk Island because we lived on Providentialis at the time because there's a lot that we need to know about this woman. It's very important to um, try to find the story. And um, so I thought, well, I'm just going to do my little bit. And then the spirit of Bermuda came in and Clarence Maxwell was on board along with Michael Jarvis and uh, a few others. <coughs> and of course, Clarence gave a lecture topside about Mary Prince. So I was kind of nervous because, you know, I was an English teacher and he was a professor. And um, so I went up and said, if I come tomorrow, I've got this really old Land Rover that's my husband's and I could take you and show you some of these Mary Prince sites that are on Grand Turk, the ones that I had up here. So he said, sure, that'd be fine. And the next day I showed up and just about everybody crammed into that Land Rover and we went down and uh, Colin Brooker was alive at the time, who was a knowledge holder from Grand Turk, and he owned um, the land where the slave owner's house had been. So he, and next door was called the Wood Mansion, another wooden structure, and um, he, got a, he also owned that, and he gave us a tour through the building. And upstairs, there was this incredible chest made out of a dark wood that was all carved with snakes. And Clarence, who I didn't know very well, was quite 
enthralled with this because he told me, he said, that was carved by Africans. And I, I'll never forget that. And I've often thought about that chest and wondered what happened to it. Um, we left Grand Turk Island because Hurricane Ike was coming in. So we went back to Providenciales. And of course, Grand Turk was decimated. And two weeks later, we went over and Colin Brooker, the man who had given us the um, tour, had died. He was the only person who died in the hurricane. So we were back there for his funeral. And um, what had happened was the Wood Mansion, he'd taken the cladding off of the outside because he was refurbishing it. The hurricane lifted the top, the roof right off and then pushed it back down. And also the long shed that I showed the picture of the back end got blown off, but it, it was still there. So I've often wondered what happened to that piece of furniture. Anyway, um, so it wasn't Clarence, but it was um, Kimberly Monk, who's a Canadian. And she said, you know, you should do your PhD on that. And I thought, me? Like, I haven't been to school for 14 years. I don't know if I could do it. But it looked like nobody else was going to take the challenge. And I also kind of felt the spirit of Mary on Grand Turk. And um, I thought, you know, I'm supposed to do this. I better do it. If I don't, I'm going to be on the wrong path. So I started. And um, here I am, roughly 10 years later. I would have never imagined in a million years that I would be in Bermuda telling you Mary's story. <laughs> So um, I'm very grateful that uh, I was invited and was in, able to do it because I kind of feel this isn't, it's my story the way you know, it all happened, but this is Mary's story. It's kind of like she wants you to know this. And, um, and now um, Lovita and Kim are, are funding this project with uh, Clarence and I. We're going to England and we're going to author a book about Mary, which I hope is going to be, um, you know, the best one yet, because there's many, many books that have come out, but there's nothing that's got um, this historical information. And also there's nothing, like Clarence is going to be writing about uh, Mary as an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And um, she was a powerful woman. She was a rebel. And that's he's going to take her voice and bring it forward that way. So I think it's going to be great. And also, as I said, I think it might be time for to be thinking about a screenplay, you know? So um, and with... <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. All right. We are very happy to conclude what's been a remarkable evening with uh, a tribute piece uh, choreographed by Conchita Ming entitled A Woman Named Prince. The narrator is Grace Rollins. Music is by Mark Isham, Michael Bolton, Josh Grogan. Uh, the premier performance of this was by the National Dance Theater of Bermuda for our department's emancipation service on July 24, 1993. Senator Crystal Caesar was the soloist and has performed the role on six other occasions. Tonight's soloist is Arielle Lee Ming. She was given the opportunity to study abroad from 13 years old at Idlewild Arts Academy as a dance major. She has dedicated many school breaks to attending Alvin Ailey's summer programs Alonzo Lyons Ballet Intensive, Broadway Artist Alliance, Debbie Allen Summer Intensive, Stella Adler Studio of Acting, and this year, at 16 years of age, experiencing internships in London at professional companies. Ariel has said of her journey, in dance I have learned the most successful tool is to be well-rounded and a curious learner. I started dancing at the age of three at Somerset School of Dance and moved to United Dance Productions for nine years, joining the company at age 11. I'm beyond grateful for the parents I have who are my support system, managers, ongoing encouragement to, accompany, to accomplish my dreams and my hardest critics. Conchita Ming was my first mentor in dance and I continuously learned valuable advice. I want to thank her and the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs for allowing me to embrace the attributes of Mary Prince through movement while learning more about my country's histories. She is supported tonight by Anointed Wings of Fire. The Anointed Wings of Fire flag ministry was formed in 2015 under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Deborah Evans at the First Church of God in Somerset. This unique ministry was born when Sandra Williams approached Rona Pedro to join her. Both Rona and Sandra developed a unique bond similar to a mother and daughter. In fact, Rona commonly refers to Sandra as Mommy Sand. Since the start, they have ministered both locally and internationally. 
Ask them and they will proclaim that the flags are simply an extension of their inner worship and praise to God. Please enjoy the performance and thank you for your attention tonight. I was born at Brackish Pond in Bermuda on a farm belonging to Mr. Charles Minus. My mother was a household slave and my father, whose name was Prince, was a sawyer belonging to Mr. Trimmingham, a shipbuilder at Crow Lane. When I was an infant, old Mr. Minus died, and there was a division of the slaves and other property among the family. I was brought along with my mother by old Captain Darrell and given to his grandchild, little Miss Betsy Williams. Captain Williams, Mr. Darrell's son-in-law, was master of a vessel which traded to several places in America and the West Indies, and he was seldom at home long together. Mrs. Williams was a kind-hearted, good woman, and she treated all her slaves well. She had only one daughter, Miss Betsy, for whom I was purchased, and who was about my own age. I was made quite a pet of by Miss Betsy and loved her very much. She used to lead me about by the hand and call me her little nigger. This was the happiest period of my life. For I was too young to understand rightly my condition as a slave and too thoughtless and full of spirits to look forward to the days of toil and sorrow. At 13, Mary Prince was sold. The Von Du master, who was to offer us for sale like sheep or cattle, arrived and asked my mother which was the eldest. She said nothing, but pointed to me. He took me by the hand and led me out into the, the middle of the street and turning me slowly round, exposed me to the view of those who attended the Von Du. I was soon surrounded by strange men who examined and handled me in the same manner that a, a butcher would a calf or a lamb he was about to purchase, and who talked about my, my shape and size and like words, as if I could no more understand their meaning than the dumb beasts. I was then put up for sale. My new master was a captain who lived at Spanish Point. After parting with my mother and sisters, I followed him to his store and he gave me into the charge of his son, a lad about my own age, Master Benji, who took me to my new home. I did not know where I was going or what my new master would do with me. My heart was quite broken with grief, and my thoughts went back continually to those from whom I had been so suddenly parted. Oh, my mother, my mother, I kept saying to myself. And my sisters and my brothers. Shall I never see you again? I still live in the hope that God will find a way to give me back my liberty and give me back to my husband. I endeavor to keep down my fretting and to leave all to him for he knows what is good for me better than I know myself. Yet, I must confess, I find it a hard and heavy task to do so. I am often much vexed, and I feel great sorrow when I hear some people in this country say that slaves do not need better usage and do not want to be free. They believe the foreign people who deceive them and say slaves are happy. I say, not so. How can slaves be happy when they have the halter around their neck and the whip upon their back 
and are disgraced and thought no more of than beasts, and are separated from their mothers and husbands and children and sisters, just as cattle are sold and separated? Is it happiness for a driver in the field to take down his wife or sister or child and strip them and whip them in such a disgraceful manner? Women that have had children exposed in the open field to shame. There is no modesty or decency shown by the owner to his slaves. Men, women, and children are exposed alike. Oh, they tie up slaves like hogs, moor them up like cattle, and they lick them so as hogs or cattle or horses were never flogged. And yet they come home and say, and make some good people believe that slaves don't want to get out of slavery. But they put a cloak about the truth. It is not so. All slaves want to be free. To be free is very sweet. have been a slave myself, and I know what slaves feel. I can tell by myself what other slaves feel, and by what they have told me. The man that says slaves be quite happy in slavery, that they don't want to be free, that man is either ignorant or a lying person. I never heard a slave say so. me up. 